So Luke's gospel today tells us that the angel Gabriel addressed Mary and said, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. There's a lot that's been written just about that statement. Actually, we could just stick with that first statement today. And I'm sure there are books written about that. But I'm just going to go into it a little bit to see what we can understand from that. So greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. So what does it mean to be favored by God? Is this something, is this how Gabriel addressed all the humans that he talked to? Or is this particular to Mary? And what does it mean to say the Lord is with you? Is that also particular to Mary? Is that the same thing as favored by God? Or are those different things? So I'm not sure. I feel like there's a lot in here that we have to unpack. So usually there are three common understandings of this part. So the first is the idea that Mary was born without sin. Either that even in the conception that there was no sin involved whatsoever, and also that Mary is so pious and so sinless that that's why Gabriel addresses her this way. And that's why she gets picked to be the mother of God. There's a lot, there are many traditions where that's the understanding. is because of her piety and her purity. But then there are other interpretations. There's also the idea that Mary accepts Gabriel's proposal and says, okay, this is going to be very difficult. I, I personally can't imagine how difficult to be a preteen mother during this time under the Roman Empire, knowing the way society was at that time. But even in spite of that, that she trusts God, she has faith. And it's because of her faith that she was chosen. And because of that faith, that's why she's the favored one who the Lord is with. And then there's a third interpretation, which is a bit what Reverend Jeff was talking about last week, which says it's actually because Mary is so modest, because she doesn't have any money, she doesn't come from any kind of noble family or anything in particular, she has no money, she's young, she's going to have to give birth in a stable. And that's why God picks her, because God is always with the poor, God is with the lowly. That's kind of the idea behind the Magnificat. So those are the three most common interpretations. So Mary's piety, Mary's acceptance and her faith in God, or kind of just her status as being very poor and humble. So those are the ideas. So, and I have no problem with any of those interpretations. But there's another one that I'm kind of wondering about. And that's, what if there's nothing in particular that's special about Mary at all? What would that be like? And before I get into that too much, I want to say that I recognize that Mary is one of the most beloved women in the world. So she is such an important role model for so many women, for so many people. Uh, she is the most powerful woman in Christianity. This is such an important status uh, for a lot of people who come from faith traditions originally where there was a divine feminine. She kind of took that over and became the divine feminine for them. And so she's really upheld as this amazing, powerful person, even in a Catholic understanding, as someone who can intercede with God. So if you do something and God doesn't want to talk to you about it, maybe you can talk to Mary and Mary will go and talk to God on your behalf. So this is someone who's a wonderful role model for women in particular. So saying, well, what if there's nothing special about her can be pretty controversial. And I don't mean it that way. I don't at all mean to denigrate the importance of Mary. But I'm just wondering for us today, if we just explore, what would it mean if just everybody could be favored by God and the Lord could be with everybody? So what if there's nothing in particular that makes her different from the rest of us? What would that mean about our understanding of this story? So I think I mentioned uh, when I first started preaching here a few years ago that I grew up Roman Catholic. And so actually the Virgin Mary was very important in my tradition growing up. So we had several statues of Mary. I think we had one statue of Jesus, but several pictures and statues of Mary, which I know is not uncommon in Catholic families. And we would always say the rosary around the dining table together, where if you ever have done the rosary, where you say 10 Hail Marys and one Our Father, you kind of go around that way four times. So that's a lot of Hail Mary full of grace. The Lord is with you. So this kind of thing. You are favored by God. The Lord is with you. And I know for my mom in particular, Mary was very important. My mom prayed to Mary a lot. And I know it was really important for her to understand her as this kind of divine feminine. And as someone who is this unconditional loving mother. 
So this is the week of love. And Mary, as always being this loving mother, especially if in your own family you might not have that love otherwise. I can say that my, my own grandmother on my mom's side was abusive and struggled with alcoholism. So she didn't have that in her own life. But my mom could pray to Mary and get that unconditional love in that way. So and I know that really meant a lot to my mom. And I'm sure there are many people who see Mary in that way as that sign of that unconditional love of God. And that's very important. But I must confess, see, we're going full Catholic here, so I have to confess. <laughs> that even when I was a kid, even though I had a very favorable experience uh, in Catholicism, actually, even when I was a kid, this idea of Mary as being so pious or so different from us, I found that not as helpful. I think the idea if Mary and Jesus are both totally without sin and they're so divine, then when they sort of give us these teachings, then I feel like that's unattainable. It's sort of like if I want to learn how to do a cartwheel and someone says, here, watch this video of Simone Biles. And I'm like, well, that's not going to help me. <laughs> I can't learn anything from that. She's Simone Biles. She's amazing. Like, what am I supposed to do? And so I kind of feel that way with Mary and Jesus, that if we understand them in this removed way, kind of on this pedestal, then I don't know how to take it. Even with Jesus, and I know this is more controversial, but even when we kind of focus on Jesus' divinity, and then he gives us the Beatitudes, and even when he loves the people who are killing him, and he's this incredible person, but if we kind of focus on the divinity of Jesus, then when I hear those teachings, I'm like, well, okay, sure, you can do that, but you're God. Like, what do the rest of us do? The rest of us are just normal people. So how can I learn from that? So if you hear this story and you kind of think, okay, well, of course the angel came to Mary because Mary is so perfect. She's so wonderful. She's so different from us. Then, I don't know, the angel isn't going to come to my house. I don't know if you've seen my house, but she doesn't, and the angel does not want to <laughs> set foot in my house right now. So that just feels so different. So I understand the importance of that kind of loving, that all-loving figure, that perfect figure. But what if, so in one way that can be really good for us, but what if that feels unattainable? And then we're like, okay, we're going to revere Mary, we're going to revere Jesus, but we're not like that ourselves. What can we do? So instead of thinking that way, what if we think that Mary is like us? So what if God is with us? What if we are the favored ones and God is with all of us? So the angel Gabriel, with his awesome voice, could just show up at any of our doorsteps at any time and say, the Lord is with you. You are favored by God. How would that change our understanding of the story? So do we feel that way? I know this is something that I appreciate in Buddhism, at least in Zen Buddhism, is you don't have to follow even the eightfold path and kind of do everything in a really methodical way. You can have awakening at any point. You can sit down and kind of focus on your practice, focus on your breath, and the divine can be with you. I know I've had some folks saying, going into Christmas, what's it like having a Buddhist practice, but then working in a church? Does that feel at odds for you? And it really doesn't, because that's how I understand. I guess in Buddhism, it's Buddha nature, but I see that as the same thing as the Holy Spirit. So that sense when we're quiet, when we take some time in prayer, or when we take some time to meditate and just be silent, and suddenly you'll get this knowledge or this awareness that you don't have normally. Maybe we're too frazzled the rest of the time, but if we sit, look at that. We too can be favored. The Lord can be with us. And that feels really true to me. I think that's part of the thing I struggled with in Catholicism growing up, is this idea that they're so different. And I was like, I don't know if that's true. Because even as a child, I know children can have these amazing mystical experiences or these spiritual experiences. And how do you understand those if you think that those only come to people who are perfect or who God has specifically set apart? But what if that isn't true? What if all of us can have that? So then it becomes a matter of not focusing on like, okay, what am I doing wrong? These other people, they're so great. That's why God visits them or that's why they have these experiences. That's different than me. But what if we all have that ability to have that? We all love ourselves. So if this is the week of love, if God is the God of love, then I think God loves all of us. They say that you're not supposed to favor one child over another. So even if one of them, I guess, is the son of God, you're supposed to favor everyone equally. 
So I don't think we have to strive to become favored by God. And I think that's an important message, especially around the holidays. It's so easy to kind of buy into this idea of a perfect Christmas or a perfect family dinner or a perfect gathering. But I don't think we need that. I think God is with us all the time, no matter where we are, whatever we're experiencing. Last week, I I was telling some of my colleagues about this. I was trying to make a gingerbread house with my kids. And there's kind of the Pinterest version of what that's going to look like. And then there was the actual version where I had three kinds of icing, none of which were sticky somehow. And so I was like, maybe I'll just hot glue the thing together and tell no one to eat it. So like I said, the angel isn't in my house if I have to be this kind of perfect person, like if that's how we understand Mary. But if Mary's not like that, if God's with us all the time, and then if we don't feel God, rather than kind of going into this spiral of like, well, what's wrong with me that I don't feel God? So you're saying you feel God, so you must be better than me, you must have figured this out. What if it's not like that? I know I've used this quote before, but it's one of my favorites uh, from Hafiz, the Sufi poet Hafiz. He says, ever since happiness heard your name, has been running through the streets trying to find you. So what if the angel Gabriel is actually just knocking on doors and saying, greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. What if all of us experience that over Christmas? That that's the true spirit of Christmas. That we can look to Mary and Jesus as this amazing story, this amazing family that we can learn a lot from specifically. But also that no matter where we come from, no matter what our background is, even if we have no money, even if we're unmarried, even if we have no idea how we're going to spend the next year, that God is with us and always favors us, no matter what. And finally, I was joking with another ministry colleague that if you don't have a prayer, you can always just insert a Mary Oliver poem, that that will always work. (laughs) So I just want to insert part of this poem by Mary Oliver, I'm sure many of you have heard, called Wild Geese. And I remember the first time we heard it in seminary, several people were like, oh my goodness, where has that been my whole life? But she says, you don't have to be good. You don't have to walk on your knees for 100 miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination. It calls to you like wild geese, harsh and exciting, announcing your place in the family of all things. So I hope during this Christmas, you know your place. You know how favored you are. You know how loved you are. And that you know that the Lord is always with you. Amen.